Now we start with culture. One of the ways the Kanoris have preserved their cultural heritage and have kept it intact for centuries is by making sure that their offspring are exposed to every aspect of it at a very tender age. This tradition played out recently when a group of youths and children under the auspices of Kanem students' body facilitated a spectacular children's derba, which was graced by notable sons and daughters of the Kanuri, led by the Shehu himself, Abubakar Ibn Umar Alamin Gabai El Kanemi in Meiduguri, the Boronu state capital. Iyamaji takes it from here. The magnificent Dandal Square in Meduguri, located right in front of the majestic palace of the shop of Borno, was agog in festive moods. Once some kids between the ages of 7 to 15, stage a mini dava akin to what used to be observed during any of the two eats being celebrated by Muslims the world over. What is that? As the whole show depicts the 53 districts under the Borno Emirate Council represented by the children, stage a spectacle to the admiration of the most robust person among the Kanuris, Shavu and his lieutenants. <laughs> Galloping, gesticulation, and even mimicking the district hates whenever they are paying homage to the show during any of the two eats was staged spectacularly. Mali Gubio comments on this rare occasion as it affects the Kanuri clan. Our children are now very much motivated, they are very interested in our culture, tradition, custom, costumes, and uh, it is time for us to support them so that they will rekindle the hope of the Kanuri tradition, Kanuri culture. Dana Bogoma Borma speaks on the significance of the events as it relates to the rich cultural heritage of the Kanuri as it relates to the mode of dressing, most especially by women, was in display to the fullest. The cultural display that was witnessed the palace, which uh, was organized by the Borno Kanum Students Association, uh, is not new uh, because even when we were very, very young children, whenever a daba was staged, uh, by the district heads, the children of uh, the courtiers and others will also stage children's daba. The event also serves as an avenue for future potential kings to be initiated into everything they need to know about royalty. <laughs> of culture and tradition and this is one step to keep the legacies and I'm so proud of those young people I mean if you don't know your culture what are we talking about now mention the name Jiga anywhere in Nigeria there is a strong probability that the famous university don and one-time head of Nigeria's election umpire INEC 
Professor Atahi Jega will come to mind, right? Interestingly, however, Jega to an average Meduguri resident and beyond refers to that tricycle vehicle popularized by its number, haulage ability, speed, and ruggedness. Ladidi Musa Ibrahim will tell us more about it. Driving or strolling along the major streets and remotest part of Medjugorje and its fringes makes one to wonder how social and economic life in the cosmopolitan city would have been without the complementary role being played by Jega tricycles in the transport sector. From the haulage of goods, even heavy ones, to transporting people, especially farmers and laborers from one point to another, Jega tricycles are always handy to justify the trust people of Medjugorje have on them any time, any day. How and when was Jega tricycles introduced to the resident of Medjugorje as a means of transporting goods and of recent passengers? Jega was introduced in Medjugorje around 2007 by the former governor Ali Modu Sherif after the ban of motorcycle due to insurgency for our use to be self-employed. Jega yana dokan kaya. Jega transport goods and people to various places like Magomeri, Kajigana, Kajiram. We also go as far as Gubio. I've used Jega before because I'm into photography, so sometimes we do use Jega to carry some of our gadgets from wherever we have work. How the name Jega was given to the tricycles is what Enti, out of curiosity, went to town to find out. Tairu Jega for Professor Atahiru Jega, most of us don't know him. He became famous during that period, so we named it after him. Jega Tricycles drivers share with NTA the fortune they are making out of the venture. We make six, seven, eight at times up to 10,000 daily. Things are no longer the same due to the removal of the foil subsidy. What is the view of an average Medjugorje resident on the conduct of Jiga tricyclists, especially on the road? Some of them drive well, while some of them are underage, they drive rough. Honestly, our jobs will never be the same without Jiga. Keke and Apep are not allowed to carry POP material. Call the presence of Jega in Medjugorje and its fringes a phenomenon you cannot be faulted as the fusion between the city of Medjugorje and Jega tricyclists is too visible to even a first time visitor. The Jega tricycles in Medjugorje city are often linked with various traffic offenses along the major roads and streets. Notwithstanding, they still remain the most affordable and accessible means of haulage and of recent means of transporting workers from one point to another owing to the removal of the fuel subsidy that made managing a vehicle difficult for an average Nigerian. <laughs> See how it is serving useful purpose, especially for workers. Good one. Now, have you ever imagined that one day you'll fall ill and go to the hospital? But instead of getting healed, you are confronted with a life-threatening medical condition? Well, this is a story of a woman who went for appendectomy to, but ended up with one of her kidneys removed without her consent or that of her family by a health institution in Jos. The Yang Giang brings us situation report. Jos community is a suburb in Jos North local government area where a 51-year-old Kamaru Busari resides with his family. Here, the once happy family is being turned into sadness as a result of the ill health of his wife, Kende Busari, who in 2018 was operated for appendicitis. Five years later, her health deteriorated. The operation lasted for about almost two, two eight in the evening. They brought her out. Around after five, he called me that I should enter theater to, to, to witness. So when I saw the woman, the only, only the intestine was outside. So I couldn't bear it and I ran outside the theater. After a week, he decided to die. He called me separate, separate that day. Privately, that uh, when I reach out now, I should go and buy the water, all the swan water, plenty. Should be, she should be drinking water always. After like, a, after like a two or three months, 
she started complaining about this uh, abdominal pain again. So then she had to go back to the hospital. The, 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 the scanning was conducted and uh, then there's some medicine. The same hospital? The same uh, hospital. Uh, that faithful day I paid 13,000, I could remember. So since that time, uh, she keep on going back, like um, almost a month or two months, every time. This last two weeks again, I said, okay, madam, look, look, look let, me, let me tell you, I'm fed up now. You have to go to just teach, just university teaching hospital to go and conduct the scanning. Mm. So on Monday morning, this last Monday, she went to the hospital. Around after 4, 4 p.m., she called me that uh, she don't understand what's happening. That uh, this all these doctors, they keep on shouting on her that, uh, madam, why did you allow them to do this kind of thing? Why did you agree that uh, they have removed one kidney from her body? Kende is now lying critically ill from the alleged removal of one of her kidneys from this Murna hospital in Nasarawa Gom by one Nua Kekere held in high esteem for his philanthropic gesture to the communities. The magnanimity shown by the proprietor of the hospital, the family says, has become a huge financial burden for them, calling for justice for Kende. This man has cheated my sister a lot. He puts my sister in pain. Please, Nigerian people should help me. Plateau State Police Command confirms the incident, which it says is being investigated. The case was reported to our divisional police officer at Nasara Go. He did what um, he is expected to do by moving swiftly to um, action, and he got Dr. Noah Kekere arrested. Also, um, the doctors that um, took part in the operation with him. Nigerian Medical Association Plateau State Chapter has however come up with a disclaimer that Noah Kekere is neither their member nor a doctor. Even though complaints are brought to us, we can only forward that those complaints to appropriate quarters. And Plateau State has not, had, has not had a health monitoring team for about eight years now. This health monitoring team is to go around the different local government areas to know what is going on. As NTA News is pursuing this story, another victim a 75-year-old Ibrahim says three years ago he had hernia surgery in the same hospital owned by Yellow, as he is popularly called, without signing any consent form, only for his family to be told that one of their father's kidney is missing. See, the years I have been suffering up and down. This is the time when I'm supposed to be enjoying my children. Let the government please assist us. It is on record that some victims have also approached a religious body on the plateau on the same matter. We intimated the uh, security agents and uh, I can, I'm happy to say that the police commissioner uh, directed that the facility, the premises where he operates should be sealed and it was sealed. Well, NTA News will continue to track the story as the situation unfolds. <laughs> We are following the story and of course we'll keep you posted. But importantly, please investigate hospitals before you go in. Very important. It is mind-boggling to know that some people spend huge amounts of money trying to get certain things in life others who already have them on the platter don't have regards for. I don't even appreciate what they have. How can a woman carry a pregnancy for nine months only to discard the baby in an unimaginable way? Though not new, but this particular story which dominated the media space recently is what Adiola Komiakere is seeking answers to. Let's see her findings. Children, they say, are bundles of joy. But with the worrisome trend where young ladies are abandoning and disposing of their newborn babies in inhuman manner, it's beyond the comprehension of many. This viral video of a baby rescued by a man after the mother threw him into the stream in Badagri area of Lagos is still bringing shivers to many. They wondered what could have led to such a mortifying act by the mother of this barely month old baby. After bad madness and two wickedness, it's a very wicked act of throwing a baby off from you. Is there no advisor? Then will help her. Some residents of Lagos have divergent views, while some attributed the act 
to lack of love, care and outright wickedness. Others say it could be a psychological issue. It's bad, it's not good. Poor parenting strategy. Parents are no longer parenting their children. Everybody is on the street. The man is on the street, the wife is on the street, everybody hustling and bustling. So the question is, who takes care of the children? House help take care of the children, movies, TVs, Facebook, WhatsApp, hey, come on. Dr. Dakbo Adegbaju of the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital in Lagos, on his part, attributed the lady's action to various reasons, including postpartum disorder. There are so many things that can happen to a woman after delivery. There's what we call pupillary blues. This usually occurs like 24 to 14 hours after a lady gives birth. And it is characterized by crying, being tearful, I mean, being helpless, they don't know what to do. Usually common in first timers. And then this one can progress to postnatal depression, worsening of the symptoms, in which they will not be, you know, crying and then they'll be talking about not wanting the baby, they will refuse to breastfeed the baby, they refuse to take care of the baby. This one can also progress to postnatal psychosis in which the mother of the newborn baby will be hearing strange voices. If the mother of this child is actually acting with her normal senses, what are the penalties due her in the court of law and measures that can be taken to stop this trend? The joy of motherhood, the pain of labor, no mother will willingly bat a child and throw that child, you know, the way the lady was alleged to have done. That child has suffered, uh, you know, harm. If the child had died, mother and mother, it doesn't matter if you give birth to that uh, life because you have no right to take a life. In extreme case, if she's convicted for murder, she could face life imprisonment. In all, many say every child deserves love, care and right to life, no matter the situation or circumstances the parents may find themselves. At this point, it's not a question of condemnation. It's how will society be able to assist if a girl decides that she's no longer in a position, either financially, emotionally, or psychologically, to continue to take care of another human being, they can give up that child for adoption. These are some of the things we might begin to think about as society becomes more complex. Making sure that women take proper care of their mental health during pregnancy, it goes a long way in nipping it in the bud. But other school of thoughts believe that children that cannot be catered for should be given up for adoption or to the state for proper care and protection rather than birth and throw them away. They believe that change is the end result of all through learning is certainly playing out in the education sector. This is evident in some higher institutions of learning which have chosen to take the bull by the horns by insisting that indecent dressing and in fact immorality are unacceptable on campus. While some observers see the clampdown as on indecent attire within the university environment as some sort of rights infringement, Marian Vincent Oko in this report seeks to find out how the students are taking it. Recent developments have shown that most young people want to look trendy or fashionable. The implication is that some of them stretch beyond the mark, not knowing exactly where to draw the line. Hence, decency gets sacrificed on the altar of modernization. Most worrisome is the fact that institutions of higher learning dominated by these young people who are mostly students have now become centers for display of such outfits often considered indecent. The recent turn of events in some of these higher institutions has become a subject of conversation, that is, the introduction of dress code by management of such schools. We are here for learning and discipline. Completely moral discipline. While these may not be entirely new for some departments, the fight against indecent dressing emanating from the dress code policy is what is, however, catchy. To be honest, I think schools should dictate how students should dress. But then the way to, inform, to enforce that shouldn't be in a, form, in a form of harassing them. And if you just allow people to dress how they want, you will see people dressing in ways that are crazy. I think it's not right for any department or school to give students 
like a particular color or dress code to come to school. But on the other hand, indecent dressing is taking over. There are a lot of students that try dressing indecent. Sometimes you won't know they are going to school. The fact that some of these institutions have taken it beyond ban on indecent dressing to outright war against immorality on campus no doubt raises some basic issues, particularly on family values. Most parents are not alive to their responsibility. They are failed, first and foremost, before they leave the home. Parents and guidance ought to have checked the dressing mood of their children. <laughs> Professor Wunari George Will is the Vice Chancellor, University of Port Harcourt. For him, the policy is necessary to ensure they produce graduates who are truly sound in character and learning. Some people felt people should be allowed to dress, which I said, no, there are policies. This is a university. There is a dressing policy for students. And so those who have agreed to be students of this university should follow it. We don't coerce anybody. All what we do is we appeal to their conscience. And that's why, you see, for the past two months or so, we have been doing advocacy. While the argument for and against this approach to restoration of morality in higher institutions of learning continues, proponents of the policy insist that the benefits will be far-reaching and should be upheld. Hmm. You know, they say dress how you want to be addressed. And it's something we should um, think about. Don't just, uh, the way you dress somehow says a lot about you. Attending the Diamond Jubilee Age is remarkable in more ways than one. It is often described as the age of senior citizens for a civil servant, it is the retirement age. For Munilola Udo, whose associates describe as loyal and committed, bowing out of service as permanent secretary, Ministry of Women Affairs, is really grand. Olusheye Adiago was at the celebration of this landmark achievement. First Baptist Church, Gimbia, Abuja, plays host to the head of the civil service of the Federation, Dr. Falashade Yemi Esson, who leads some permanent secretaries and other top government officials to join one of their own, Monilola Omokumi Udo, and our family in Thanksgiving. <laughs> The immediate past permanent secretary, Federal Ministry of Women Affairs, joins the rank of sexagenarians, leading to her exit from civil service. Leading the clergy to offer prayers of thanksgiving to God on behalf of the celebrants, senior pastor of the church, Reverend Tom Takpachore, acknowledges God's faithfulness in the celebrant's life, giving her unblemished and fulfilled career, as well as being able to mark her 68th birthday. And I think it's a great testimony that should encourage every one of us as we work, as we serve. Let's look up to God for strength. The downpour after the service does little to dampen the celebration as accolades from family and friends continue to serenade the celebrant, generally described as brilliant and forthright throughout her career. Very happy birthday, long life and a very, very fr fruitful and fulfilling life after retirement. A very straightforward person and very hardworking. And I think that's what has brought her this far. Very loyal and she has left footprint wherever she had worked and uh, that gladdens my heart. Attaining three scores on heart is no doubt a blessing and even more special for Moninola Omokumi Udo after 32 years of an indelible career as civil servant. Reaching the summit can only be by the grace of God, she says. God is the Alpha and the Omega. So why don't we love God while we're still strong, while we can still find him? So that is the message I'm trying to say, that look, let's come and thank God for seeing me through 
since I was born in 1963 till I'm 60 and throughout my career in the service spanning different MDAs and I've been able to impact you know my generation for good and I'm also retiring blemish free. Oyo State born Muninola Udo began a civil service career in 1991 as a program analyst and rose through the ranks to a director after which she received her appointment as permanent secretary in 2020. Until her retirement, Muninola Udo has served in three ministries. What a way to bow out. We wish her the very best. Welcome back. We're starting this segment with Man Woman Matter. Many often go into relationships and marriages full of expectations, such as a 50 50 proposition where each person contributes equally in the relationship. Sometimes, however, hopes are dashed when expectations are not met. You don't know how something it happens. Amako has been rubbing minds with negotiations on the implications of this. Married couples, to a large extent, believe that the best way to live together is share responsibilities equally, that is the 50-50 approach. This implies that each party does 50% of the work required to maintain a healthy and happy relationship. This, to some, may sound mathematical. What is the take of Lagosians on the matter? Like now you are two, two in one. So the man is supposed to bring something, the female is supposed to bring something, so that it should be 50-50. You play your role together, you move together and for good. No, it is not good to be 50-50. As a man, you must cater for your wife. It should be it should be hundred percent man, but a lovely woman can support you. Nikki Forty sister. I believe a man should shoulder more than a woman. If the woman is more than a man, that one is not it is now left uh, within themselves to decide. If the woman is ready to shadow the responsibility, it's for the families. These religious perspectives appear to contradict the fifty fifty proposition in a relationship which they say is not in line with God's plan for marriages. You can see that from the prophet said that we need to complement each other, whereby you are under the roof of your, your husband, so your wife must work, be submissive to you. Then the husband also complements what the wife is doing. That the two persons who are consecrated in that relationship bring themselves wholly and entirely into the relationship. They give of themselves without counting the cost in order to serve their family and to become a good example to the society. So 50-50, never. You can't even put a percentage on what each person should put in or can bring into the marriage. Experts are, however, of the view that gone. Other days, certain responsibilities are restricted to a particular gender. They give words of advice. Yes, they are breadwinners. They will make money. But that is not the only thing. What of those people you are making money for? Do you have contact with them? Can your daughters talk to you about some of the advances they are getting from men as a, an adolescent? If as a parent, both male and female, your daughters, your sons cannot tell you, be free with you to tell you about some of those things, then you are not parenting. It takes two to tango is a common cliche used in relationships and experts advise couples to look above the 50-50 proposition in marriage. They should imbibe total selflessness, sacrifice good communication skills and maximum commitment towards the success of their marriages. For me, I think the bottom line is for couples to complement and support each other and still on relationships, the social media space is so large that men and women use social network services differently and at varying degrees of frequency. Several researchers have argued that women tend to use social media more than the men. Whichever way the pendulum swings, would you want your spouse to have a huge presence on the social media? Toyibat and New Fowoshe samples the views of FCT residents. Growing research has shown that increased usage of social media has had 
a negative effect on marriages and relationships. So would you allow your spouse to be active on social media? Well, so I took this fun question to the street of Abuja and many residents had interesting responses. Depend. If she's wayward life, if I notice, I will not allow her. If I know that, it means not that she's not wayward. It means not. Yes, I will allow her to be active on social media because uh, as a filmmaker, she's free <laughs> to be active on social media because from there, we get more fans and more, more, you know, I can allow her. Make someone connect with another person so you can get more business or do any on do or on social media so that is why we make her to be active on social media so somehow i will but uh, when it is taking much of her time i will not take that rather i will caution her to you know yeah, we trace her steps and uh, the way she do it so maybe if he's famous on social media definitely he's going to make some money so definitely i'll have some your yeah, spouse will ask you to quit social media would you quit I will love quit social media. I will not quit social media because social media is the ultimate. Because from that social media, you can get more information about the society, about the country. Christianity and Islam are two major religions in Nigeria, which often guide people's social conduct. Clerics of these faiths advise against the misuse of one's presence on social media taking decisions at home because of uh, what they have seen on social media or some people behave in certain ways because of what they have seen on social media so if a wife or the husband is so active in social media he may be drawing his value system from information is getting there and those value system may not be healthy for his home uh, the man himself has been obliged not to disobey Allah on social media but with respect to his wife he is responsible for her also so the Prophet said the youth Yani, the one that does not have protective jealousy over his women for you don't care who your wife talks with you don't care who your sisters interact with you don't care who your daughters interact with the officer Allah Salam said that the youth will not enter paradise although many agree that the benefits of social media are numerous but custodians of societal values believe that excessive use of it is not healthy for couples okay that is why they advise keep your marriage out of social media but people are on social media for different reasons the, the, the important thing is moderation but if your spouse is making money from social media you have to find a way to support respecting each other is also important now there is this perception by outsiders that some residents of the Federal Capital Territory portray a fake lifestyle. Do you agree? Well, th keep thinking of that as we go on a break. The answers we'll get when we return. Now, over time, African countries have relied on expatriates to manage their national football teams. Austin Edemudu, in this report, extrays how ex-African players are making inroads in football management. Have won the Orange African Cup of Nations. The last time Nigerian national football team, the Spragos, won the African Cup of Nations, Late Super Eagles captain Stephen Keshi was there at the helm of affairs as national team coach. In recent times, some African countries are following the trend of appointing indigenous coaches for their national teams. Is it not only like one way? It's about like two ways. Like, uh, like uh, uh, federation and the players, they have to talk, talking to the one things to come back home and help in the federation. And you see, uh, the last time. You win the African Nation Cup, who was the, 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 the coach? You know, he was an ex-player, he was an ex-legend, he was a captain for the national team, and he do, well, do, he do very well. I think so today, most of the players, of the legend you got, if they not to be far from the national team, you can get successful again. Such experiments have come with remarkable success in Senegal with Aliou Sissé as coach of the Renga Lions. How about Walid Regragu of Morocco? Of course, Rigobert Sang of Cameroon and of recent Didier Drogba of 
the elephants of Cote d'Ivoire, amongst others. African football has um, grown from uh, strength to strength, and we hope it, it grows. There are still a lot of things that we have to carry with in, which, uh, in order for us to develop a team. For now, Nigeria is among some African countries that parade foreign coaches. We can't afford to get a new hand. We need to learn from what happened to all the last time when we let um, Raw left before the Nations Cup. We all saw what happened. We were unable for the first time in the non able to qualify from a group stage, and that is a big blow. As a debate about the proficiency of indigenous coaches over their expatriates continue to gain attention, former FIFA Football Development Director for Africa, Zekifli Nguafonja, believes as internationals need more capacity building to succeed. I think that because they played the game, it is enough to be an administrator of the game. But no, if they want to be administrators of the game just as they were football players, they train for that. So they also need to understand how the administration works, right? And, but then they have an expertise as former players that they can start sharing with the rest of the, of the federation, with the rest of the people. With another African Cup of Nations in sight, the performances of different countries, including Nigeria, will be a true test of how African football can grow with or without foreign coaches. I agree with you, Edemodo. And on that sporting note, we end this edition of Newsline. Join us again Sunday next week. Good night and God bless Nigeria. Mm -hmm.